We are live. Good morning, everyone. This meeting will now come to order. Welcome to this virtual meeting of the Durham Historic Preservation Commission on this fifth day of April 2022. My name is Matt Bouchard, and I am chair of the commission. This commission is a quasi-judicial board of record, and as such, all testimony will be recorded. Under this procedure, our meeting today will also be live streamed on the city's YouTube channel. The proceedings of this board are governed by the zoning laws as recorded. As such, please note the steps we have taken to ensure that each party's due process rights are protected as we proceed in this remote platform. First, today's meeting will be conducted in accordance with North Carolina General Statutes Chapter 166A, Section 19.24 which allows for remote meetings and quasi-judicial hearings during declarations of emergency. Second, each applicant on today's agenda was notified before being placed on the agenda that this meeting would be con conducted using a remote electronic platform. Every applicant on today's agenda has consented to the board conducting the evidentiary hearing on the request using this remote platform. We will also confirm today at the start of each evidentiary hearing that the participants in that hearing consent to the matter proceeding in this remote platform. If there's any objection to a matter proceeding in this remote platform, the case will be continued. Third, notice of this meeting was provided to the applicants and to the public in multiple ways, including signage posted on site, notification letters mailed to all adjacent property owners informing recipients regarding this remote platform, and a general announcement via the city's website informing the public of the same. The notices for today's meeting advise the public on how to access the remote meeting as the meeting occurs. Individuals wishing to participate in today's evidentiary hearings were required to register prior to the meeting. Information about this registration requirement, along with information about how to sign up to participate, was included in the mailed notice letter sent to each adjacent property owner. So uh, this information was also included on the board's website. The public was advised to contact the city immediately in case of objection to the case, excuse me, objection to the evidentiary hearing or to the remote meeting platform. It is my understanding as of this moment that no cases are proceeding today in which the city has been contacted by an individual with an objection to the case or to the matter being heard in this remote meeting platform. All individuals participating in today's evidentiary hearings were also required to submit a copy of any presentation, document, exhibit, or other material they wish to submit at the evidentiary hearing prior to today's meeting. All materials the city received from the participants in today's cases, as well as a copy of city staff's presentations and documents were posted online prior to the meeting. The agenda and all materials to be discussed today may be viewed at any time during today's meeting by visiting the web link for today's agenda via Durham's Agenda Center. Finally, all individuals who registered to participate in an evidentiary hearing on today's agenda, as well as all city staff participants, were emailed a witness oath and consent to a remote hearing form prior to today's meeting. Any individual planning to testify or submit evidence in an evidentiary hearing was notified that they must sign the oath prior to today's meeting. We will also refer, excuse me, we will also reaffirm everyone's oath on the record at today's meeting. Are there any members of this board that would have any conflicts of interest with regard to any of the cases that are before us today? Matt, this is Andy Goolsby. Um, I don't have a conflict of interest, but do want to be forthcoming and, and say that I live one block north of the uh, 812 Lancaster Street. Um, I am outside of the requirement for uh, recusing myself and believe I can vote um, partially with this, so. Thank you for that disclosure, Vice Chair Goolsby. Anybody else? Are there any early dismissals being requested today? Matt, I need to go for an 11 o'clock commitment. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Matt, I just need to leave by 11.45. I'm hoping we can wrap up three cases by then. But. 
Well, I can assure all of my fellow commissioners and the participants in today's meeting that I'm going to try to move things along expeditiously. We've got three cases today, and um, I think we have five commissioners. So we are going to do everything we can to get through um, all three cases by 11 o'clock today. Anybody else? Okay. As chair of the historic preservation, excuse me, start again. As chair of the Historic Preservation Commission, I'd like to remind everyone that our quasi-judicial hearings function similar to a court proceeding. Staff will first present an overview of the case, and then the applicant will have an opportunity to present their evidence. Opponents, if there are any, may then present their evidence, and the applicant may then present a rebuttal. Board members will refrain from questions or comments until each speaker has completed his or her presentation. Testimony should consist of facts each witness knows directly, not hearsay. Evidence already presented need not be repeated. All witnesses who have signed up in advance will be given the opportunity to speak and their testimony will be recorded. The board will vote on each case after the presentation of all evidence pro and con concerning that case. All decisions of the board are subject to appeal to the Board of Adjustment and then to the Durham County Superior Court. Clerk Holmes, could you please take the attendance of the commissioners who are here today? Yes. <clears throat> Chair Bouchard. Here. Commissioner Fieselman. Here. Vice Chair Goolsby. Present. Commissioner Hamilton. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Calhoun. Here. Oh, by the way, um, Commissioner DeBerry, um, he has an, an excused absence. He announced on the 17th that he will not be at the meeting today. And Clerk Holmes, have you heard anything from Commissioner Johnson? I have not. Okay. Uh, Carla, uh, any other city staff? Any word from Commissioner Johnson? Hi. No, I have not. Okay. Uh, I do believe we need to uh, vote on absences, but I would like to um, defer that vote until um, the end of the meeting at new business. Commissioners, you have been forwarded an agenda for today's meeting. Would anyone, including city staff, like to recommend any adjustments to the agenda? Matt, this is Vice Chair Goolsby. Um, just one adjustment. It is Lancaster Street, not Avenue. Okay. And a quick question. The agenda says 400 West Main Street, but the actual material for the case says 411 West Main. It's 400. It's 400. So that yeah. just should be changed on the COA. Okay. And I would like to add um, as part of new business, just an update on the positions, uh, the board positions. And then also uh, we have another update on 1106 um, uh, 9th Street. Great. So under new business, I now have. Uh, a, the minor COA report, B, excused and unexcused absences, C, update on open positions, C, update on 1106, excuse me, D, <laughs> update on 1106 9th Street. Any other adjustments to the agenda? Commissioners, you have also been provided draft minutes for our last commission meeting held on the same remote platform on March the 1st. 2022. Does anybody have any suggested revisions to the draft minutes they'd like to recommend? If not, I would entertain an, uh, a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve the March 1st meeting minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Fieselman. Do we have a second? Second. Andy Goolsby. Thank you, Vice Chair Goolsby. If we could have a roll call vote. Clerk Holmes. All right. Chair Bouchard. Approved. Commissioner Fieselman. Approved. 
Vice Chair Goldsby. Approved. Commissioner Hamilton. Approved. Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you very much. And Madam Clerk, if we could also please swear in all city staff who will be presenting today's cases. Do you members of staff swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's cases is the truth by your own knowledge or by information and belief? Carla Rosenberg Planning, I do. Grace Smith Planning, I do. Okay. I believe we are now ready to hear our first case. And so Chris, if you could please let our participants into the public hearing. Our first case today is case number COA 2100109, 400 uh, West Main Street continued. Before we hear from staff, is there any one of our commissioners who may have a conflict of interest in hearing this case? Seeing and hearing none, let us proceed, please, with the swearing in of anyone who plans to speak for this case. I understand we have at least three participants here today. Actually, it looks like more like four. Clerk Holmes? Yes. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's case, the truth, by your own knowledge or by information and belief? Let's start with Mr. Oliver. I affirm. And Mr. Navarro. I affirm. Ms. Ross. I affirm. And Mr. West. I affirm. Wonderful. Thank you all. And in the same order, could you please also affirm your consent to this hearing proceeding on this electronic remote platform, starting with Mr. Oliver? I affirm. Mr. Navarro? I affirm. Ms. Ross? I affirm. And Mr. West? I affirm. Wonderful. Thank you all. We may now proceed with a staff summary. Okay, um, Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. This is case COA 21-00109. It's 400 West Main Street, new construction continued from our um, February uh, 2022 meeting. The applicant is Stewart, represented uh, by Alden West and colleagues. Um, the owner is Five Point Center Durham LLC. It's located within the boundaries of North Great Jones Street, West Main Street and Morris Street zoned downtown design core, and it's a non-contributing parcel in the downtown Durham Historic District. As you remember, there was a, um, an approval for a demolition on this site uh, several months prior. The applicant is proposing to construct the 29-story tower. There have been some revisions um, incorporating feedback from the commission um, regarding the stair towers facing um, the streets, Main Street and Morgan Street, and then also um, regarding the parking deck uh, facing it's Great North Great Jones Street. So I'd like to introduce this revised staff report um, into the record and invite the applicants to prevent, uh, to present their case. And feel free to call out any page numbers, I'll jump right to them. All right. Thank you, Carla. Commissioners, thank you so much. I appreciate um, you giving us the opportunity to go back and, and um, look at and sort of work with ownership to address uh, some of your concerns. Uh, specifically, we'll go through the list that, that uh, Carla had mentioned um, and, and I think sort of addressed. Uh, you'll hear the word intentional a few times because I think that was what we really wanted to look, uh, focus on is coming back with very intentional responses to alleviate some of your concerns. So, Carla, if you could go ahead and just jump first page. If you don't mind, please. I'm sorry, which page? Uh, the first presentation page. I don't okay. think we can, I think we can skip through all the, the graphics and to go right to the uh, elevations, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. 
anyone has a particular page number of the PDF. Yeah, um, I apologize. I'm not sure which one that is. Yeah, page 40, Carla. Thank you. 40, okay. Yeah, we could start there. Okay. Um, specifically, um, there were some concerns. I know Commissioner Goolsby had some concerns regarding some asymmetric facades uh, and uh, particularly some massing, I think that was of concern to him. And what we've done is uh, working with ownership to kind of address there are a couple of options, but what our preferred option is we've gone back and removed some of the um, differences between the bricks that I think were causing some concern about not being in keeping with with the facades or the existing of contributing buildings in downtown district. So what we did is we removed some of the discordant colors and discordant brick materials and went back with a um, more simpler aesthetic. Um, still like to keep the uh, multiple window expressions that's uh, prevalent in, in a number of, of examples. I think those are actually after, but that's what we have attempted to do actually, particularly on, on this elevation, that was one concern. Uh, that Commissioner Goolsby had. Can you zoom out, Carla, by chance? They, uh, so this is option one, which is our preferred option again. And then what we did is um, because of being virtual, we said, well, look, let's, let's talk about maybe a, a secondary option. So if you go to the next page, correct, Jonathan? Yes, that's correct. 41. The second option, uh, which we looked at was instead of having um, a, different window system in the in the small vertical element we matched up the the individual windows again this is similar to a project that is uh, directly across main street uh with sort of the large double windows and where you carla where you have your mouse is actually where we made that adjustment uh to the second option um, again i think we prefer the first option because it blends the two different uh modules and uh add some linkage between the different facade uh fenestrations uh, but we're okay and ownership's okay if if this is a uh, maybe a more suitable in, in the commission's eyes uh, solution. Um, Commissioner Bouchard, do you want to address individual components or do we want to go through all of them first and then um, uh, go back to each one of them? Well, let's go ahead and have you uh, complete the presentation. Okay, okay. With the, okay. Uh, absolutely, thank you. And then we'll, we'll open up some questions. Thank okay, you. thank you, appreciate it. All right, so if you go to page 42, please. Uh, this is the stair tower on the uh, Main Street side. Uh, we, we took to heart, uh, Commissioner Grillsby, your concern about uh, keeping um, data lines relative to the base. This is this, this stair tower, um, I think, before was a different color brick um, and felt, I think some of the words were a little left over, if you will. And so once again, we went back and said, well, how do we integrate this in the architecture in a much more meaningful way? Um, again, there are re representative examples later on in the presentation that talk about where we took some of the inspiration to make the changes to here to this piece in particular. So it integrates more fully into the actual development. Um, but in this version, then what we've done is we've said, okay, we'll carry the datum line of the, the parapet across as an element um, an architectural element on that facade and being much more deliberate in the window system to once again, make it blend in and make it less obtrusive uh, to the overall execution of the facade. And so uh, that's, it's been mimicked and, and matched up on the North side as well. Uh, keep going, Carla, please, 43. And here again, you can see how this, um, the, the, uh, datum uh, cornice was carried across to provide sort of that, that continuous datum line to again be more a little more uh, faithful to the parapet location the parapet height cornice will of the of the podium uh, and the windows again are more in keeping with the overall execution of the building so they feel less like a a, a basic or leftover stair tower and more about uh, integration of the architecture of the overall podium uh, 44 please I know there were several commissioners who had concerns about uh, the west facade, so we went back to ownership and we worked very diligently uh, to come up with uh, a more, let's say, complete execution, if you will. I think that was one of the bigger concerns. Obviously, there is a ownership, you know, 
is uh, working to develop the phase two component, but I think there was concern obviously about long-term uh, condition of this, of this facade. And so what we've done is we went back, we heard your comments, um, we brought the brick back around the edges of the building and a little bit further, at least a full bay to the openings, uh, which lead into the deck, excuse me, on the ground level. Um, and we've surrounded then, so we put brick on either side of those to identify where those openings are. And then our, once again, we did two different versions. They're a little subtly different, but this version, what we've used is a um, screen. And, and Jonathan, if you can correct me on the, the nomenclature for it, uh, it's a printable screen. Uh, yeah, that it's it's a poly, uh, polyvinyl um, mesh fabric. <clears throat> So using some examples you can see on the upper right-hand corner, uh, ownership, you know, is committed to creating a, uh, an image that, you know, if this is sort of the outcome in phase two is delayed for any reason, they obviously are, are uh, concerned about making sure that whatever they show on that face is equally has equal quality. Um, and so one version, what we've done is we've split it up to allow the verticals to still carry through. So there's not just a continuous uh, graphic um, the graphic is yet to be determined, um, uh, but again, I think there's you see some some examples of of what it could be from a graphic standpoint. The advantage of this is if there's any damage to any of those panels, that can be replaced fairly easily, actually, um, in order to sort of maintain that long term. Um, but again, a much more intentional effort to treat this facade as if it were uh, a more permanent solution as opposed to a, a, a temporary solution. Uh, and I think they they um, they feel like this is a, a much better solution that way. Go ahead and go to the next page, please, Carla. Forty five. I think the last the the next option is again it's it's a little nuanced, but essentially saying well if if the vertical elements are are concerning, we can just close them all together. We did like to leave them a little bit of an air gap to let them sort of the deck breathe a little bit more. Uh, this is a sixty percent opaque. Is that correct, Jonathan? It's yes, that's correct. Sixty-six percent opaque, thirty-four uh, percent open ventilation. Mm -hmm. um, to meet our open deck requirement, uh, but this is a again a, a, a nuanced sort of take on on what's available. I think we prefer again option one to give ourselves a little bit more capacity to to um, fix any damaged panels or make any changes to these. Keep going. I'm sorry, uh, forty-six, Carla. And actually, um, real quick, um, on on that forty four and uh, forty five, uh, the gray. Just to clarify, the gray um, portion on the first floor um, is not exposed uh, CMU, which is was also a comment from the previous hearing. Oh right. Um, it is a smooth finish. It is part CMU, so it won't be um, block. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that. And this, uh, we just provided some axons to give you a little bit more clarity about how the brick returns the bay, um, how the the uh, stair towers are integrating the base and, and removing some of the more objectionable vertical elements on the um, more street axon uh, elevation, which is sort of the lower left-hand corner. Go ahead, Carla, one more time, 47. Um, I think you could go to so, 50 go or 51. 51. Yeah, page 51, please. Okay. Okay, these are yeah, the articulation elements. So I, I think, again, we had talk through some of these uh, vertical articulation elements about maintaining the same brick color, but obviously that the, the window patterns could change. Uh, for instance, 115 market, you've got a three, three light and a two light or a six and a four, depending on how you want to, uh, the nomenclature works. Similar to what we were trying to accomplish in um, the mid bay uh, of the facade, um, either that of the snow building where we've got, you know, a different vertical exp ex uh, expression. Um, go to 52, please. Uh, the West Facade, I know you're all familiar with, with various um, executions 
uh, in the city with graphic panels that are covering or screening. I think we were um, uh, looking more more toward the um, one on the left as far as an example of you know sort of what it might end up being relative to the final graphic presentation, but sort of playing up some of the vertical elements a little bit more. Keep uh, next one, please. And I think um, particularly, um, I know we had talked in depth about the parking stairs. And so we had gone back and looked at the, the Carolina Theater is actually one that we took a lot of inspiration from. It's a block from our site uh, where they've carried a cornice line through the, through the window system or through the, through the stair element to integrate it in the architecture. Um, similar kind of approach. Um, and so there are a couple of options. We know we had talked to uh, the 300 East Main job previously as an example. I think the one thing we felt well, like on that job, it was a true historic building that they were adding a, a modern twist to versus the where we were looking at this being integral to the actual building as a, as a baseline. And we thought the Carolina Theater was maybe a, a more appropriate um, um, example of something what we were trying to accomplish. Um, next one, please. I think the only other thing that we had uh, we want to address was um, Commissioner Hamilton had some questions, uh, concerns regarding the uh, planter that we had placed on uh, the window box planters we had placed on the canopies uh, as a way to um, mitigate the views uh, from those units or multifamily units there that look out over those canopies. And so we had gone back and, and said these are really more portable planter units that are not in ground heavy kind of things, but they're more in keeping with the scale of the building and treating them more like window boxes. Um, and so that was, we just want to provide a little bit more detail and clarity on what, what it is that we were trying to accomplish with those planter boxes. And I think, uh, Jonathan, did I forget anything? Uh, that should be, that should be it. Okay. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Bouchard. And, and at this time, I think that concludes our presentation. Thank you all very much. I will now um, open the floor for questions from the commissioners. Um, Commissioner Hamilton, um, this is more for your site group. So all in and Crystal, it looks like your site plan has a rev cloud on it for like the entire corner. Um, I'm not sure exactly what page that was on in this PDF, but could you all run through what changes that red Oh, file. I think it's it's page 29, Carla. I think I have it as 31, but yeah, 29 is two. Yeah, both of them. You can yeah. take this one. This is Crystal Ross with Stuart. Um, Katie, we had just adjusted the site walls down there and um, also eliminated the planting that was in between the um, tobacco curb and, and within the sidewalk. So we have eliminated that. Um, we do still have some planting area and site walls though along that Southern Plaza. Uh, Thank you. The same thing, Katie, applies to the Northern Plaza too as well. Um, we just adjusted the site walls there. It's a different configuration. Um, but we did eliminate all the planting once again from the curb to the face of building along Moore Street. Thank you very much. Any other commissioners with questions? This commissioner will speak. speak. Um, first of all, thank you guys, all of you, for, for taking another pass through this and incorporating comments. Um, I certainly see your efforts in, in this. And so again, just appreciate everything. Um, the one question I do have is with, with regard to the, the parapet line, um, the one spot where I see um, it still kind of uh, alters from what I see in the district is that swimming pool. And my question really is, did you look at any options of um, that's, that swimming pool piece stepping back from the parapet line so you're not breaking uh, the facade with a, a glazed element and, um, you know, in, in my personal opinion, <laughs> have concerns about that being uh, dirty over the years with, with water and, and just 
um, maintenance on the street face, but did you look at any options of, of pulling that pool back off of the street face? We, we address that with ownership and, and they firmly believe that is one of the important sales part uh, pieces of their of their overall project and so that was one item that um, they felt like they really wanted to keep I think they're they're committed to making sure that it it is uh, to sort of address your concerns about you know it getting dirty and those kinds of things um, they obviously have a vested interest in making sure they're they're uh, they're going to live in this building as well uh, and so they have a very you know vested interest in making sure that it's kept as, uh, as clean and, and as um, well maintained as possible. Um, but it, that was one of the items that they really were, um, they wanted to stick to their guns on. So we really feel like this, this is an important part of, of what we're trying to accomplish with this project. So just to kind of reiterate what I'm hearing is that for them, it's, a, it's an amenity that they, they think uh, really contributes to this project and its and its sales. Correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Goolsby. This is Any Commissioner other? Hamilton. Can I just get clarification? Andy, is your concern about how close it is to the art wall facade? No, just being on the street face, um, you know, we, as far as I know, this would be the first swimming pool that faces, faces the street um, in the downtown district. And my experience has been that these tend not to be the most clean, clean pieces of glass, um, given the water and the uh, chemicals used in, in pools. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about the long term and just what that's going to be like. You know, it. I know it's good intentions that the developer uh, is going to live in this, but um, who knows for how long things things happen. So, your concern is the glass railing near the pool. Sorry, I feel like I'm very confused by. It. Oh yeah, sure. So <laughs> okay. if uh, let's just get it up on the screen. Katie, can you go to Carla, excuse me, um, sheet 42. So there in the axon, the perspective image, the upper left-hand corner. Let's see if you can scroll to the right. Mm-hmm. So the glass railing comes and it drops down into to what I assume is the, the floor of that swimming pool piece. So water is going to be meeting up against that glass. Um, Correct. And, you know, again, as far as I know, that doesn't exist in, <laughs> in this district. Um, it's going against everything that these guys have just worked on working around the building with their parapet lines. Um, and, and just in my experience, I've not seen a whole lot of great maintenance on features like that. Okay, yeah, I was not reading that correctly at all. Like I read the pool as being in the middle. There's, there's that too, there, there is that pool. This is, this is a, a side piece. Of... So this is like a little second baby pool? It's a hot tub, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Spa. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now I understand completely what's happening. I'm sorry. I was very confused. Yeah, All right. sure. <laughs> Any other commissioners with questions? Okay. Seeing no hands raised and hearing from nobody else, I'm going to go ahead and invite anybody who is here today to speak in opposition to this case to have the floor. 
seeing and hearing from no opponents to this case, I will close the public hearing and invite discussion amongst the commissioners. And I'll go ahead and put Vice Chair Goolsby on the spot. And um, uh, Andy, is this um, a, a concern so significant for you that it could uh, impact your um, willingness to uh, approve the COA as currently drafted? I think I'd love to hear some other opinions on it. Um, I be honest with you, Matt, I go, I can convince my, myself either way um, that it is a small portion of this overall scheme uh, that they've done a lot of work to um, bring this, to incorporate our comments. Um, but, you know, I, in the long run, I, th I think it's something that's, not not what I see in the guidelines when I think about roof forms. Um, I'm not looking at guidelines about let me pull up real quick. For non-contributing new structures for design elements. Um, let's see just to. So providing details on, uh, let's see, at street level elevations, let's see. Yeah, here we go. C, design roof forms to be compatible with contributing structures in the district. So with that, I think about, uh, I, I also add in parapets with that. Um, it does break, in my, my opinion, the rhythm and order that they've established on this, this building. I think those would be the the two main ones that apply. So A and C of uh, part three, B three. Street level. I mean, am I, am I the only person with any concerns about this or, um, again, I appreciate everything they've done so far. I'm just trying to round it out here. This is Commissioner Hamilton. Now that I understand what it is, no, you're not the only one with concerns. <laughs> I thought it was some viewing platform when I first looked at it. I didn't realize it was a hot tub. Um, like even with the viewing platform, it was weird, but I was like thinking some high line element type thing up there. And now I'm like, oh, it's a hot tub. Um, I almost wish they're like, they did something like with the, to continue that, that line across there. Like if they really want to have the underwater part exposed or something, like if there could just be a continuation of the horizontal parapet, you know, cap, somehow, you know, it could be level with our water line or whatever. Um, Cause it just, it does look really um, out of keeping with the rest of the rhythm that they've created and is an atypical condition downtown. Annie, can I ask a clarifying question about what you were saying about maintenance on these? Are you saying mm -hmm. that often that glass, it's difficult to keep the glass clean or that it leaks and water runs down the facade? That, that's gonna be a different I issue, but um, yeah, I, the architects will probably have that concern <laughs> um, and, and probably spend a lot of time detailing that. Um, but it would be from the, from the glass aspect. Um, yeah, but there, there is, I mean, certainly a concern about detail in a proper way to where water uh, would not leak down the facade um, or the hot hot tub water leaking down the facade. Um, but more, more concern would be the glass and the cleanliness of the glass. I see the point that you're making. I've never seen one of these in real life, but I'm Google imaging now. 
Um, can certainly see the point you're making in terms of how it fits with the guidelines. I can also see the owner's perspective that it's cool. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that, that's where my head is. Andy, could you give us the uh, criterion again or the criteria uh, of concern to you? Just want to make sure I'm. Yeah, the sure. Right so I was in non contributing structures. Yep. Uh, B. Yep. And uh, so three, B3, yep. design elements. And A and C were the ones that I was looking at mostly. Um, Got it. B, B is debatable, but it depends on your take of street level elevations. I mean, Matt, I don't want to. I don't want to push this thing out further for this team. I know they want to get get going here. I mean, um, is this is this an item that we can discuss with the applicant uh, and and figure out a way to move forward with some kind of motion today? I think that might be a call for Carla and for Krista um, as to whether this is something that could be looked at. Uh, again, after approval of the COA. Um, Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. It, it does seem like it is a detail that um, could be remedied in some way through a condition um, if, if you were able to reach a, a solution um, at this hearing um, and we're satisfied you didn't need to see a new iteration of drawings. You, you could be staff approval um, potentially. What kind of condition did you have in mind, Carla? Well, um, one thing to um, ameliorate the um, sort of the cornice line is like maybe using like a metal mesh panel over that glass so that visually it doesn't um, appear like a break in the in the roof line. Um, that doesn't solve the potential water leakage issue, um, but it does kind of disguise um, while still allowing the hot tub swimmers to see through the, the metal mesh. Um, that's just an idea, um, but something like that, or even the placement of the hot tub could be moved. Would that require another major COA? Well, I was thinking as a revision to the current one. Um, okay. And it seems like a simple enough change that it wouldn't necessarily require a new revised staff report to be viewed by the commission. That's your decision. If you, if you need to see new drawings, then you would continue it, or you could just um, recommend, um, see if the applicant is amenable to moving the tub or, or refacing it in some way. Um, and approving that with that condition and staff would approve it. Any other commissioners? Um, obviously Vice Chair Goolsby and uh, Commissioner Hamilton have expressed concerns um, that might prevent them from supporting the overall COA based on this design feature. Are there any other commissioners who wanna provide some input? Any other commissioners who might not be able to uh, lend their support to the COA as it uh, currently exists based on this design feature? April, can I just ask to hear your thinking? Um. I don't, I don't know what I think about it. I, I don't have, have a basis based on the guidelines about regarding my opinions on this. So um, I can't, I, I don't, I can't share it, but as far as what Commissioner Goldsby is kind of concerned with um, the break in the design, 
Um, I'm kind of of the opinion that it is so high up. Uh, I, I think it could potentially be, um, how do you say it? Like asset design, like something, um, kind of a quirk in the design if it, if it was done in a different way. Um, if you say, I'm, th I'm thinking about it differently that I don't have a basis to support based on the guideline. It's purely a design um, thing. I think that it could, it could appear to be part of the design of the building if it was kind of um, made to look like an asset or ornament in some way. But I don't know. I mean, I agree with you that it does break um, the pattern, but I don't. I don't think it will distract from the historic district. And so I'm, I'm taking the approach. This small. This is a small detail, but how does it affect the district or the building as a whole? Whole. I, I'm not sure that it distracts from anything at this point. So. I'll, I'll weigh in. I I um I don't see I really don't see the problem that would hold up the COA because the owner and the designer has been warned that that glass could be could end up being uh just uh, very dirty and not well maintained. Okay. Somebody tells you that about your the glass that you have then you have to put some extra effort in keeping it clean. If it leaks, you have to fix it. So, uh, you know, in other words, they didn't want, I don't think it interferes with uh, the historic district or the area or whatever. Uh, I, I, I just don't understand why it would, um, in other words, they have a problem that they need to maintain, period. And there's probably a lot of problems, you know, in the overall design that requires maintenance. So I don't have a problem uh, with that. So I mean, I wouldn't, you know, if they replace the glass with some other material, um, you're going to have a problem with the material, whatever it's going to do, to block the, uh, the swimming pool or hot tub or whatever it is. This is so minor giving the overall project. I think we've heard from everybody except for me on this issue. Um, my struggle on the maintenance piece is I'm not sure that we have a criterion that speaks to it. On the roof form piece, that is where I am struggling a little bit. Um, I think of the criteria that Vice Chair Goolsby has cited, 3C strikes me as the most on point, design roof forms to be compatible with contributing structures in the district. Then you go back to the definition of compatibility to achieve through careful attention to the following aspects of the proposal, setback, orientation, scale, massing, height, proportion, rhythm, materials, architectural details, and landscape features. Um, to me from street level, I, I, I can see it both ways. Um, it, it, it does seem to be an interruption in the rhythm of that, uh, I guess, glass parapet. And th the notch is somewhat distracting now that it's been pointed out to me. But before it was pointed out to me, I'm not sure I was distracted. <laughs> so I, I, I'm hearing sort of both sides. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to justify not approving the COA based on this feature, but I also appreciate the concerns that have been expressed, you know, th th there it is again. I mean, now that's been pointed out to me, I mean, I, now I, I, now I'm focused on that notch. Um, and if there is some way 
to approve the COA with a condition, assuming that the applicant would agree to the condition to, to try to, to minimize the visual impact of that break in rhythm. Um, that to me, from the perspective of uh, being faithful to the criteria is, is my biggest concern. That's not to um, diminish or dismiss the concern about maintenance. I'm just not sure how much uh, jurisdiction we have over that particular issue. Um, on the question of the, the sort of visual impact of this break in the rhythm, I think we do have jurisdiction over that. And I, you know, I, I think it's worth having a little bit more additional discussion about what that condition might look like, what, what sort of, um, uh, I think, Carla mentioned screen mesh, what that might look like and whether the applicant um, would be amenable uh, to something along those lines to uh, try to reduce the, the visual impact of that, that break in rhythm. Um, Chair uh, Bouchard, can I just really quickly get one clarification question? Because when I look at this perspective on page 42, it bothers me. But when I look at the perspective on the bottom left of page 50, it's not the same. Um, and so I would like clarification on which one is more correct because on 50, that bottom left, that like parapet cap is getting pulled down and around the pool and kind of creating like a continuous line and not, okay. so it's, it's a very different feel than the one that we're seeing on page 42. And understand. <clears throat> and I'll go ahead and reopen the public hearing for the purpose of having Mr. Oliver or anybody else respond to that question. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Um, I see your point. Um, I think um, this is one where, and I apologize, this is sort of a new issue for us. Obviously, uh, we did not have documentation to sort of address this one. I do want to go, I'll come back to that, Commissioner Hamilton. Can we go to, as a little bit of a defense point, can we go to the 50, I want to say 52, 53, where we had um, the representative examples. Again, I don't have one that's that directly addresses this, but actually it, um, between the upper, uh, I'm sorry, you were right there at 51, 53, 52, 51. Yeah, 50, I'm sorry. Right there. On the upper left, two is a good example, I think, of, of sort of addressing crenellation or a break in the facade that it has multiple vertical elements and breaks in that this is again i don't have an exact answer for it because i don't had i didn't have a something to address but here is a good example you see the little green building 115 to the left of the 115 west main where there is an arrhythmic break in the in the cornice line with a couple of different pop-ups and so forth again not a direct example but it's what i have to work with and then the snow building with the crenellations and the matriculations that come up above the uh, parapet to break that that look so i think there's examples of something similar uh going back to your question uh commissioner hamilton i think the intent is and i apologize that if bringing again again trying to find some ground here to work with if if it helps to bring the cornice line down and around and frame that opening um uh, per the rendering um and be more faithful to that rendering that's something that we can you know, that's easy enough to do, right? That's one of those things where we can make a quick adjustment. And, and if that helps sort of address that idea, you know, aside what it is behind it. And you know, obviously, um, C Commissioner Calhoun, you made a good point that, you know, they have to keep it clean because that's, you know, that's part of a maintenance issue that happens anyway. Um, I appreciate that. Um, if doing something like this, I think also, uh, if it would help, I think we could talk about putting a cap on the, the Plex, um, you know, it's a it's a very thick glass wall, right? Because it has to actually hold in the glass, the water. If putting a cap across it in some capacity helps to carry carry that line across, that's obviously something I think that we're open to. Um, so that line appears to carry through. I think uh, I think I'd have concerns uh, about putting anything in front of it. It sort of defeats the purpose of that that effect, right? Um, and so I, I think there are a few things again that we can we can do architecturally to make it feel a little bit less concerning uh, per this you know this rendering. I think uh, thank you, Commissioner Hamilton, for pointing that out. Um, that's an easy accomplishment for us. That's an easy thing for us to to make the adjustment to the the precast members. So um, you know we're we're open to kind of 
working the, the little details to make sure you're comfortable with it. But again, I think there are examples of not exactly this, obviously, um, but similar breaks in the um, um, cornice lines uh, in different examples. So does that, does that help? Um, and, and real kudos to the uh, use of Ameliorate um, um, today. Um, I appreciate you working hard and, and, um, and I am a very appreciative of all of your opinions about, you know, what makes this building, what, what's important to you all. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, commissioner Hamilton, if it, if the perspective on page 50 is correct or is made to be correct, instead of what I'm seeing on page 42, that helps me feel comfortable with this because it looks more intentional at that point. And like, framed element and not just a cut in the roof line like we're seeing on page 42. Yeah, I feel like that's a lot. It gives it a weight and just feels a lot better to me. I think I'm in a similar spot. Thank you for articulating that, Katie. Yeah, and I, and I think the examples that are in the application prove that um, the historic buildings within downtown um, do break from their rhythms uh, at times. Um, and so this, this building is in line with that. Vice Chair Goolsby, I'll give you the last word on this. Uh, I'm, I'm fine to move on. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I, think no, I appreciate everyone's one spots in it. Um, it's given me enough comfort to to let's uh, to put a motion together. So wonderful. I'm now going to reclose the public hearing. Um, I can invite any additional commissioner conversation that uh, might be uh, desirable. Uh, and if none, um, I'll entertain a motion. Do we need to add a condition? that the cornice line will continue. And is that the correct term? Cornice line will continue as per perspective on page 50 of the... That would be staff's recommendation. Okay. Commissioner Hamilton, would you like to contemplate bringing the motion? I will be happy to bring the motion if everyone else is in agreement. Let's go ahead and get a staff recommendation uh, before we do so. Um, Carl Rosenberg, Planning Department. Staff would recommend approval of the application with the condition that the um, cornice line um, along the south elevation be brought around the outline of the hot tub. And Commissioner Hamilton, before you uh, begin um, making a motion, I do want to uh, make one uh, observation and, and perhaps ask Krista a quick question here. Um, obviously, Commissioner Johnson uh, joined us at the beginning of this hearing. Uh, she was not sworn in initially, uh, but I think that um, she has heard the entirety of the evidence and um, I believe is in a position to, to vote on this case. Uh, Chris, if you agree, I would ask the Clerk Holmes um, uh, note Commissioner Johnson's attendance at today's hearing. Yeah, Chris, if you're City Attorney's Office, I think that that's fine. Um, Amanda had noted like kind of in a chat when she entered and it was right when the hearing was starting. So I think it's acceptable for her to vote. Great. Clerk Holmes, can you change the attendance to reflect uh, Commissioner yes. Johnson? Yes, I'll go ahead and call you Commissioner Johnson. Present. All right, I got you. Great. Thank you for that little administrative detail. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Hamilton, floor is yours. All right. Um, the Durham Historic Preservation Commission finds that in the case COA 21001094400 West Main Street, new construction, the applicant is proposing the construction of a nearly 30-story tower 310 feet tall on a vacant lot. The building will be constructed with stacked brick masonry, concrete, and glass at the lower levels, and metal framed glass walls and metal panels in upper levels. 17 street trees will be removed from the site and 23 new street trees will replace them. Seven large, 25 to 27 foot wide by 56 to 10 inch in height, polyvinyl coated fabric mesh panels at 34% opacity will be placed along the west elevation of the parking garage if construction of phase two on this parcel does not begin within 
Ooh. Uh, what should our time frame be on this motion? <laughs> Sorry, I Sorry. forgot. I put that I'll in start there. again on that one. Uh, is it like a what's a temporary CO typically like six months? Andy, do you have a you have a hand? And that is just a suggestion if you wanted to put a time frame on it. Okay. Sure, Gosby. Yeah. No. Um. Threw me off too. Uh. <laughs> God, what was the last one? I I thought it was sixty days. The last one I've seen. For a TCO. Uh. Yeah. So, how much time after TCO would we want? to require um, the mesh panels if phase two is not gonna begin. So how long would we, the question is how long would we be allowing an exposed that's, garage space that's without that's exactly those? Right. That's exactly right. Three months, six months. Yeah, I'm thinking six. It's fine by me. Laura has a thumbs up. April and Faye, are y'all all right with six months of an exposed parking deck? If it's not good, okay. All right, I'm getting thumbs up from April as well. Okay, so then I will start this motion again with the knowledge that I will say six months. <laughs> The Durham Historic Preservation Commission finds that in the case COA 2100109400 West Main Street new construction, the applicant is proposing the construction of a nearly 30 story tower, 310 feet tall on a vacant lot. The building will be constructed with stacked brick masonry, concrete and a glass and glass at the lower levels and metal framing glass walls and window and metal panels in upper levels. 17 street trees will be removed from the site and 23 new street trees will replace them. Seven large, 25 to 27 foot wide by 56 foot 10 inches in height, polyvinyl coated fabric mesh panels of 34% opacity will be placed along the west elevation of the parking garage if construction of phase two on this parcel does not begin within six months. Therefore, the conclusion of law is that the proposed addition and alterations are consistent with the historic character and qualities of the historic district and are consistent with the historic properties local review criteria, specifically those listed in the staff report and the Durham Historic Preservation Commission approves this certificate of appropriateness for case COA 21001094400 West Main Street scope of work, new construction with the following conditions. The improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and testimony presented to the commission at this commission hearing and attached to this COA. The improvements may require additional reveals from other city or county departments or state or local agencies. The applicant is responsible for obtaining all required approvals related to building construction, site work and work in the right of way and a compliance inspection shall be performed immediately upon completion of the work approved herein. Approval is conditioned upon the approval of site plans currently under review. COA 2100334 and D2100401 and the cornice line on the south elevation shall be continuous along the hot tub as shown in page 50 of the application materials. This is uh, Chair Bouchard, one suggested revision to the motion uh, after six months uh, as read by Commissioner Hamilton, I would add of issuance of the temporary certificate of occupancy for phase one of the project. A motion amended as suggested by Commissioner Bouchard. We have a second. I can second, Mrs. Laura. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Fieselman. Clerk Holmes, roll call vote, please. All right. Chair Bouchard. Approved. Commissioner Fieselman. Approved. Vice Chair Goldsby. Approved. Commissioner Hamilton. Approved. <clears throat> Commissioner Johnson. Approved. And Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Motion passes six to zero. Wanna congratulate the applicants uh, and thank you for your um, 
good hard work. Um, you're incorporating the comments we made at the last hearing. You're working with us today. I think all of us have a vested interest in this very important project and, and getting it right. And uh, I think we've made good progress over the last uh, two or three months uh, to make that happen. So best of luck uh, to you all as you move Thank forward you. with the project. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you all. You. Appreciate all your, your work as well. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Everyone, my suggestion is we continue to power through here. Um, we have at least one commissioner who is leaving at 11, and uh, I think we should go ahead and move forward with our next case. Uh, Chris, I would ask that you go ahead and bring in our participants for case COA 200008, uh, 804 Shepherd Street. And before we hear from staff, is there any one of our commissioners who may have a conflict of interest in hearing this case? Seeing and hearing none, let us proceed with the swearing in of anyone who plans to speak for this case. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's case, the truth by your own knowledge or by information and belief? I do. Thank you. Sarah. It's Sarah Lockenman. Hi. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lockenman. And do you also uh, assent to this case being heard today using this electronic uh, remote platform? I do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We may now proceed with the staff summary. Hey, Carla Rosenberg Planning Department. This is case COA 220008, 804 Shepherd Avenue, new construction. The applicant is four over one design represented by Sarah Lockenman. The owner is West 4th LLC. It's located on the Southwest quadrant of the intersection of Shepherd Street and Yancey Street, zoned residential suburban medium, RSM. It's a non-contributing parcel in the Moorhead Hill Historic District. Um, so the applicant is proposing to construct a two-story house on a vacant lot um, with associated site work. Um, if you'll remember, probably close to a year ago now, there was um, a demolition of a non-contributing structure on the site. So I'd like to introduce the staff report into the record and um, invite the applicant to present her case. And feel free to shout out any um, page number that I can jump to for you. Okay. And Ms. Lockman, before you get started, uh, I see that Mr. Thomas Hennessy has joined us. Uh, Mr. Hennessy, are you planning to speak? Uh, <clears throat> I don't believe so. I think uh, Sarah should be able to handle the presentation. Well, why don't we if, go ahead and I am here if needed. Let, let, let's swear you in anyway, just to get it uh, passed this as an administrative requirement. Uh, Clerk Holmes? No problem. All right. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's case, the truth by your own knowledge or by information and belief? I do. And Mr. Hennessy, do you consent to proceeding with today's hearing through this electronic remote platform? I do consent. Thank you so much. Ms. Lockerman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, a couple minor notes about the staff report. One, the owner is West Forth, and it says John Hennessy. His name is Tom. Um, I don't think I that's apologize. a good but, uh, And there was one thing I had sent an updated site plan that included a ribbon driveway. And in the staff report, it says um, that there would be a solid driveway. So I think that's... Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I think that the site plan is correct. And the staff report on page four says that it is a fully paved rather than a ribbon driveway. So I think that was just a something that got updated one place and not another. Um, that site plan is actually a really useful thing to look at. At this, um, this lot had a larger quadruplex on it in a different configuration. And after it was demoed, the owners got the notification about that um, storm sewer easement from the city. And the amount of lot that it took up made initial plans for the lot um, a little bit different. So it's ended up with a two-story single family house that has sort of a jagged 
massing to the rear of it because of the site. However, as we know from all the historic houses and two-story things around town, the back of it actually follows a lot of patterns that you see um, in the city as things get added on to gradually. So it was uh, un an unhappy accident that I think has turned out well for the design. Uh, because of the constraints, we're going as far close, as close to the street as we possibly can, and as tall as we possibly can, based on other things on um, in the surrounding areas. So the lot is a little bit low, and there are much taller things around it. So we felt like we had the room to go up as high as we did, and it's um, not quite as wide as the contributing structures up the block from it. Um, you want to switch to the um, exterior elevations, Carla? I um, see if I can give you a page number. Eleven. Yeah. Um, so this is a side gable house with um, a lap siding and a bay window to the front. The front porch um, is is slightly different depths um, because of how that bay projects into it, but we wanted to get that front porch across. And um, at the back, you can see there's a gable going back and then the sort of shed roof off to the side, like you would often see an enclosed porch um, on a historic home. The windows are two over two, and we're doing our best to match uh, neighborhood precedent of some of the larger vernacular Victorians in town. There's some up the block on Yancey and on Parker that have a similar feel to this. So I'm happy to answer any questions y'all have, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Ms. Lockerman. Mr. Hennessy, anything you'd like to add? No, no I, I agree with everything that Sarah said. She's, uh, uh, you know, she's great. <laughs> Thank you. With that, I'll open the floor to commissioners to ask any questions they may have. This is Commissioner Hamilton. Um, just one quick question. Overall, I feel pretty comfortable with this one. My only question was about this bottom left elevation with the windows with your stairs. Um, mm -hmm. And can you just explain why you went with that window configuration at the stairway, I guess? Just a little background on that. You mean the double with the transom above? Yes. That's um, the, the tra I guess it's a transom, but it's like two feet above the double, right? Right. I think that was to get a sort of a, a standard size window um, that was fairly easily accessible with match that would be at landing height with the header height to go at, at the transom to match the other windows on that story. Um, I am... 100% sure that if y'all wanted a little tweak to that, it could be done. I know underneath that, there's that long stretch of blank um, that is both the underside of the stairwell and the kitchen. Um, so there's no, there was an effort to get more windows from an earlier iteration. There weren't very many windows on that side of the house at all. Um, and that was an effort to get more windows on that side. Uh, so it wasn't a big blank wall. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner Hamilton. Any other commissioners with questions? Seeing and hearing none, I will invite anybody who has signed up to speak in opposition to the case to speak. Seeing and hearing nobody, I will close the public hearing and invite any discussion amongst the commissioners. Commissioner Hamilton, did you get the answer you were looking for in your question? Yeah. Overall, I like the application design. It's like good. That rhythm seems a little wonky, but it's not like, oh my gosh, I can't approve <laughs> wonky. It's just like a little but I understand the stairs and, you know, some of that type of stuff. Um, and functional windows are always something I appreciate as someone who's, you know, lived in places with non-functional windows. So, um, yeah, it's, 
not my favorite, but also not like can't vote for it. Uncomfortable. So I agree with you, Katie. The rhythm does feel off. Not the worst thing on the planet, but yeah, agree. Any other commissioners with comments about this design element or any uh, other aspect of the COA? If not, I would ask for a staff recommendation. Um, well, staff would be interested to know what sort of tweak Ms. Lockenman would suggest, um, but otherwise could recommend approval of the application. All right, I will reopen the public hearing for the purpose of seeing if Ms. Lockman has any thoughts. Um, I see two possible solutions. One would be to get rid of the transom windows at the top that pair um, that are high up, which I think would be nice to add some light to the, the upper landing, but are one of the things that are unusual in that layout. Um, we could also see if there's a way to bring them as a unit closer together so that they're mulled um, with the upper sort of touching, with those transoms touching the pair. Um, there are definitely examples of that. There's a big old craftsman um, four square that is on the east side of Vickers that has a situation like that in its stairwell um, that I, I is a neighborhood precedent. So that would be another way to do it. Um, I'd want to be sure that the, the windows were still accessible from the landing at that point. And I'm not quite sure of the elevation change um, on the interior, but that's something I'm sure we could we could talk about if um, if y'all are interested in, in bringing those two units closer together. The second version that you mentioned is what I had in mind. I saw that you were trying mm -hmm. to keep that sort of that line um, mm -hmm. with the existing position, but um, I think the rhythm would actually be improved to move them closer together. To drop it down or to raise yes. the pair up? To, yeah. to drop the transom down so that it becomes an actual, um, yeah, mold mm -hmm. transom. Now, Ms. Lockman, is that something that you would need to work on in terms of making sure it fits within your, your overall design concept and well, in this particular case, I am I am not the designer. Um, I am the I am the presenter of this. And um, what I would love is if we could get that uh, filed under staff approval so that it's something that we could just work directly with Carla to make sure we can get a unit that does that or have a fallback where if we can't get them all together, we just get rid of the, the upper transom pair um, so that we can move forward in general and not come back next month. Um, but I, I think it should work either way. If, if I may, uh, Sarah, so on the agenda, you all may know that uh, legacy revisions has, Mr. Cecil Barker has a, a matter coming up. So he's, uh, he's listening and watching in. So he's actually our builder for this project. And he just sent me a text and he said, should be, should be able to mull those windows together. So I have no problem if we, drop down the transom and mull them together. I think that would look great. Um, I think it should be simple enough. Great, let's do it. <laughs> yep. And if Cecil, if you're listening, thank you. <laughs> if we could have one of the commissioners working on some language potentially for a motion to make that change, that'd be terrific. In the interim, I will uh, once again close the public hearing and reopen the floor for any additional commissioner comments. Looks like that fenestration issue was the primary concern here among the commissioners. I will go ahead uh, once more and ask for a staff recommendation based on the additional testimony we've heard. Staff would recommend approval of the application with the condition of staff um, approval of a new elevation um, showing the two transom windows on the left side elevation to join with the window pair in the stairwell. Do 
Do we have any of our commissioners who would like to make a motion? I can do so, Matt. Sandy Thank you, Vice Chair Gillespie. One second. All right. The Durham Historic Commission, Preservation Commission, excuse me, finds that in the case COA 22000008804 Shepherd Street, new construction, the applicant is proposing a new two story structure on a vacant lot. The structure will measure 31 feet in width at the street and 30 feet in height, uh, set back 12 feet, seven inches from the street. A full front porch measuring six to 10 feet in depth will span the street facing elevation. The structure will be constructed with cementitious fireboard siding, a German profile, red bricks, fiberglass clad wood windows, mostly two over two double hung, a solid wood front entry with side lights and transom, a, fiber, a fiberglass rear entry door, a wood porch railing and architectural asphalt shingle, roof shingles. Uh, light will consist of, lighting will consist of four black metal sconces, two flanking front door, one beside each rear and side entrance. A nine foot wide concrete driveway uh, will connect ribbon. I'm gonna uh, restate that. A nine foot wide ribbon concrete driveway will connect the street and two space parking pad, 25 feet square at the rear of the structure. Therefore, the conclusion of law is that the proposed addition and alterations are consistent with the historic character and qualities of the historic district and are consistent with the historic properties local review criteria, specifically those listed in the staff report and the Durham Historic Preservation Commission approves the certificate of appropriateness for case COA 22000008804 Shepherd Street, new construction with the following conditions. One, the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and testimony presented to the commission at this commission hearing and attached to this COA. Two, the improvements may require additional approvals from other city or county departments or state or local agencies. The applicant is responsible for obtaining all required approvals relating to building construction, site work, and work in the right of way. Three, a compliance inspection shall be performed immediately upon completion of the work route herein. And fourth, uh, that the left side elevation windows at the stairs, the transom and the uh, double hongs will be uh, paired in some configuration approved by staff. And that elevation will be provided to staff for approval. Do we have a second? Commissioner Hamilton, second. Thank you, Commissioner Hamilton. Clerk Holmes, roll call vote, please. Yes. Chair Bouchard. Approved. Commissioner Fie Fieselman. Approved. Vice Chair Goldsby. Approved. Commissioner Hamilton. Approved. Commissioner Johnson. Approved. Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you all. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good luck with Thank the project. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, folks, this is normally when I take a comfort break. Um, I know we've got some time constraints here. Do we want to push on or do we want to take a quick five minute and come back at 1030? I'm okay to keep going. Uh, push on. Let us then push on. Chris, if you could go ahead and bring in the participants for our next hearing, final case on our agenda today, which is COA 22000009812 Lancaster Street. Before we hear from staff, is there any one of our commissioners who may have a conflict of interest in hearing this case? 
Seeing and hearing none, let us proceed with the swearing in of anyone who plans to speak for this case. All right. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's case, the truth by your own knowledge or by information and belief? And if we could get Mr. McGee on the camera. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGee and Mr. Barker. <laughs> yeah, he's, yes. He's in the same room. <laughs> yeah, creating a bit of an echo effect here. Um, is it possible for perhaps you to be together on the same screen? Sure. Come over here. <laughs> Thank you very much. That should help with our feedback issue. Uh, if uh, Clerk Holmes, you could uh, re-administer the oath to Mr. Barker. Yes. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in the public hearing proceedings for today's case, the truth by your own knowledge or by information and belief? I do. Wonderful. Thank you both. And if I could, uh, beginning with Mr. McGee, uh, ask if you both consent to this hearing uh, moving forward this morning uh, on this electronic remote platform. Yes, we do. And Mr. Barker? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you both. If we could please have a staff summary. Carla Rosenberg Planning Department. This is case COA 2200009812 Lancaster Street. Modifications. The owner and applicant is Revision Developers LLC, represented by Cecil Barker. Um, located on the east side of Lancaster Street between Green Street and West Markham Avenue. It's a contributing structure in the Trinity Heights Historic District, a zoned residential suburban M, RSM. Um, and the applicant is proposing um, numerous. Um, changes to fenestration, including removing what appears to be a, a non-original um, arched window opening at the front, um, and also replacing some entry doors um, on the front, extensive changes to the fenestration on the sides. They're non-original um, units, um, but they're going to be changing the grouping significantly. Um, also to replace a, a rear dormer um, on, um, yeah, on a rear dormer with a larger one. Um, and just numerous changes. Uh, so I'd like to introduce the um, staff report into the record and invite um, Mr. Barker and Ms. Mr. McGee to present their case. And feel free to call out any page number and I'll jump to it. Okay, so we're, uh, we're doing a full renovation on this property. Uh, with some minimal uh, enhancements on the front, mainly the odd window being removed. Uh, and then if you look at the side elevations, you'll see where we've changed the, the side elevation, the rear, and uh, added some windows, all in keeping with the style of the home. Uh, and I think the material list supplied uh, tells you a little more about the project as far as windows and so forth and siding materials. Okay, thank you, Mr. McGee. Mr. Barker, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, not at this time. I think Mr. McGee's covered it and the staff report has covered the submittal. In that case, I will open the floor for questions from the commissioners. I'll go ahead and kick us off. Um, in terms of that um, rounded window and the uh, front elevation, um, what information if any, have you been able to uncover about uh, when that window might have been placed in that location? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, there it is right there. Thank you, Carla. It doesn't appear to be original from the standpoint it's this odd window in an odd space. I don't know what the purpose of that window was. 
But um, we demoed the inside part of that. We, we? we took the yeah. we took the sheetrock off, and um, it, it, the window appeared to have been added at it, some point. Yeah, it was added by, at some by, point by, by looking at the framing members and so around it. So the plaster has been removed on the interior. It looks like it's an added component. Hard to tell from the outside. <clears throat> Would you expect this sort of feature uh, to be part of a structure uh, designed and built in the mid 1930s? I really wouldn't uh, because I don't understand its purpose. Purpose, and generally that's a lot of stuff's purpose built. And we've done several houses. As a matter of fact, one, two houses up. I've never seen one of these windows around, so. I'm, I'm uncertain. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That's all I have. Other commissioners? Can I just ask for a clarification? In the photos in the packet, there seems to be some things that are painted blue and with the wood and gun condition and some things that are yellow and peeling just like the one you've got up now what's the what's the blue situation um the 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 photo of the blue was showing uh the example. style an example of the window that we selected uh, from an adjoining property okay got it yeah thanks mm -hmm. This is Commissioner Goldsby. You mentioned you did a, a structure on that same block. Was it the house next door to this one? The the I think it's painted brown now. No, it's the one the other direction that's blue. It's actually in that photo. It's 806 okay. Lancaster yeah. Street. 806, Chris and Elsha's house. I think you're sounds like you're one of their neighbors. Uh I'm I'm a block up. Okay. So, so attachment so, uh, 14 is is uh showing a photo of the window style that was used at 806 Lancaster, which we uh, did a renovation in addition on, I don't know, three or four years ago. The reason I, I bring up the house to the north, uh, the two-story one, is I, it does have a, um, a rounded window to the side porch of it. Um, in a similar configuration. Um, the reason I'm bringing it up is um, sometimes when, when the houses were constructed, you know, you see one or the same builder does the one next door and puts in the same, a similar feature. Um, so it just brings into question the, the half round window on this structure uh, when I was seen on other, other properties on the street. Would you like me to pull that up on Google Street View? That would be that would be good. Um, it's eight fourteen Lancaster. And when you get there, Carla, it's not. Um, the, the quite the street facing elevation it's um on the left side of the porch so you kind of have to look at it from a, a perspective piece i'm going to share my screen and um you can mm -hmm. help guide me to where i need to go so this is the house that we're discussing right now. And you're talking about this brown one or? Yeah, so go to um, go the other direction, one clip down. Um, sorry, this so way? So to the north, no, the other direction. Okay. So, all right, so you can see that half window. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've never noticed that. But uh, it looks to be a lot higher than the other one. So I don't know if it was added or 
maybe they have this hair salon, right? I think the difference is that the the subject property that we're looking at has the half moon front facing, as if it was a uh, kind of a major feature, um, and this one is kind of on the side facing the, the porch area, sitting area. Um, it is it is it's it is odd to see that kind of right there at the front of the house. Um, I don't know, but it is interesting to see another feature right next door. <laughs> and to our knowledge, there is no other example. Is there another example of a a, a prominent moon um, half moon window house? I say half moon. I mean, I'm half round, semicircle. Not to my knowledge, but um, I think this is interesting that Commissioner Goolsby pointed this out. And I'm sure with research, we could find out, you know, whether they did have the same builder. I think it might be, and I don't know this, but it looks like these are replacement windows on this house, or at least a good portion of them. I don't think all these windows are original. Could be wrong. I haven't, I haven't been snooping around their house, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's on my nightly walk, so I, I see it often. Um, so. And all of the windows on the house that we're reviewing right now, um, they, are, they are all vinyl windows. They're all replacement. So if the window in question is original, it's the only original window in the house. Is that correct? I wouldn't know if, I mean, I, they look replacement windows from this picture. And no, was, I'm sorry. I'm talking oh, about. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, on, on our house? You're exactly yes. right. Yes. Yes. That's right. So if it is original, it's the only original window left. That's right. It doesn't quite have the same, I mean, it has this sort of sill. Um, here that maybe the other one didn't have. It's not at the same head or height as any of the other windows. It sort of has the appearance of being added at some point. <clears throat> Were you able to find the outline of the original window that, that you're supposing was there? Were you able to find any sort of framing that indicated the window was the size you're no, proposing? No, but a lot of times they use that structural, the top plate as the header on these old houses. So I don't know that it would have been that pronounced. <clears throat> Carl, I take it you don't take anything from the Sanborn maps? No, unfortunately, um, it, it's not going to show the, the window. Yep. Only on industrial buildings does it really show window materials and placement. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? I will say that I'm Curious about this question, if it is historic or not, particularly given that the two houses side by side both have it and I'm Googling now to try to figure out if, if there's a reason behind that. I'm not quickly finding the answer, but I am curious and feel like if it is historic or tells some sort of story, it's worth knowing that uh, now. Mm -hmm. But Google doesn't quickly have the answer. I am trying. <laughs> I have, I have seen these windows in a number of historic properties, both you know here around here and also in Rocky Mountain. So uh, that's the feature. Now, what's the, the proposal is to remove it and do what? The proposal is to 
proposal is to take that window out and do what? That's correct. The proposal is to replace it with a window that matches others on the house. possible for it to stay. I would not like for it to stay now ma'am. It's a it's in a really strange spot for the interior of that house. That's why it leads me to leave even if it were an old window that someone salvaged or kept, it seems to have been added. It's not in a foyer area as you see here. I would assume when you come in the front door of this brown house that there's probably a drop zone below that half round. That's why it was there, or that noon glass. Is, that's probably why it was there. I don't know why it would be on that front wall of the other house. So, no, we would like to, to remove it so that we can bring some commonality to that front area. What you're saying about the usage in this brown house makes sense to me, and I can see the confusion on why it's lower in the wall on the yellow house and how it would be frustrating to work with as the resident of the house. I can ask the applicant uh, once more and at the risk of flogging a dead horse. C could you describe for me what you did see when you Moved either removed either the, the drywall or um, the plaster that that led you to believe that this was added after original construction. Well, I didn't see any evidence of new frame yeah new framing members. Um, we didn't see a header either. There was no header there. Yeah, I don't know if maybe there wasn't for some reason a window there at all before, and this was added. Yeah, that's it's a little bit of a mystery. Okay. Yeah. I've got a question for Carla, but I'm going to hold off until we um, exhaust all the questions of the applicant. Any other questions for the applicant? If not, I will ask whether or not there is anybody here who wishes to speak in opposition to this proposal. Seeing and hearing from nobody, I will close the public hearing um, and open uh, the floor for commissioner discussion. And I'll go ahead and exercise my uh, chair prerogative to go ahead and ask Carla a question. Carla, if you could help us understand um, the architectural style of the overall property and whether or not in your experience, this sort of half circle window would be consistent with that architectural style? Um, so I agree that the placement seems odd. It doesn't usually take such a front seat. It's usually a decorative sort of, um, sort of side display or something. And exactly like usually opening on a foyer, um, so I, when the applicant said to me that they believed it was not original, I took that at face value. Although I do think it, it shouldn't be too difficult to determine just by looking at the wood and the quality of the wood it's made of um, and, and any hardware that might be used in it as well. Um, so I think the placement is unusual, um, but I think having this sort of decorative element is is not unusual. I think it's just the placement. It's usually a more um, sort of subtle um, use, not something that's in such a prominent location. The balance is off. Mm -hmm. Is this, a, is this a craftsman style house? Um, so it's a little post um, craftsman, but 
yeah, it's it doesn't have a lot of the decor like this one over here has a lot more craftsman elements. So it's it's a little bit post craftsman. Okay. Maybe vernacular. Yeah. With, with columns. My observation is all the evidence that we've heard, and we, we must make our determinations based on evidence, is that it's not original. Um, do we know that for certain? No. Um, have we heard any evidence to suggest that it is original? I'm not sure we have. Um, and so my, my view is I don't think we can um, consider not approving this application based on our concern, this might be original an original window. It, it, it seems like the, the, the weight of the evidence that we've heard suggests that it is not. Um, and that is in fact um, unusual, at least with respect to its placement, uh, if not its outright existence. So th th those are my thoughts on the issue, but I'm, I'm obviously um, open to hearing other folks' thoughts and concerns they might have about it. Yeah, I agree with you, Matt. Yeah, Matt, I don't believe we've got the evidence to say that it's not, not original to the house. Um, we don't have any images of the framing inside to substantiate what's going on in there. Um, from the images here and what's in the application, I mean, the trim boards or the siding appears to be installed in such a way that it looks like there was, it was done originally. I mean, it doesn't look like anything was spliced in. I could be wrong about that, but just from the images that we have, it doesn't appear to have anything that's spliced in, um, suggesting that putting in a new window and cutting it in, they would have to take off some siding and put on new siding around it. Um, Unless there was not a window there before, there wouldn't be any splicing. I would find that unusual to not have any window there at all as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have evidence that the walls inside the structure changed? No, I don't have any, no, I don't have any. Because maybe have this was a foyer type yeah. area. Oh, oh no, yes, yeah, no, no. There's, there's not. There's a corner. Uh, there's a corner fireplace across the room, and this is definitely the front room of the house. I would have expected to see this window, if anywhere, around the side porch where they added that you know, 80s looking door. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that, you know, you talk about the materials of the window, the, the window could be original to that time period, but I don't know that it was in that location originally or with, or even on this house originally. Yes. Yeah, so. Commissioner Johnson. I was just thinking, um, I think we need certainty. I mean, I, I, I think from um, a stylistic approach, a aesthetic, aesthetic approach, understanding what these houses typically look like, yes, that win window wouldn't fit. But in the case that there was something done that was abnormal, you know, a, 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 a ornament out of the box by the builder, um, I think the applicant has to should maybe perhaps should provide us with, with a little bit more evidence um declaring that but 
to say, I don't know. I don't know if we can rule on that. Do we need more? I, I think we need a little bit more evidence to be clear. Commissioner Gould, I, I agree with you, April, um, that, that we can't rule for sure without further evidence. And, you know, walking around the neighborhood, of, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of classic um, examples throughout the neighborhood. They've all got some kind of uh, peculiar aspect to them. Um, whatever the owner who built that at that time you know, brought to that piece of property. So, so hypothetically, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Goes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, just be good to know for with certain, you know, what the framing looks like inside and some close up photos around the, um, around that window. And yeah, is it a, is it a single pane window? Um, is it trimmed out original? I mean, there's just no evidence right now to have that. So hypothetically, if we were to recommend to this applicant that we hold off on the vote and um, ask them to provide us with additional information, um, additional investigation, what, what it, I mean, obviously you started listing some, some things to look at, but could we provide that guidance in terms of what we think that additional investigation, the, the additional steps and additional evidence we'd like to see uh, might look like? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so it all kind of comes into the evidence aspect of, you know, giving us the photos that we're asking questions about, you know, what's the framing look like? What's it look around the window, um, on the exterior in terms of the, the siding? Um, and is it, I think Carl asked this question, um, is it the one existing window in the house, meaning it's not vinyl? Is it a, is it a wood window? Uh, what else? Are there any other things that would be helpful? Carla, are there any other steps that can be taken from an investigative point of view that might not necessarily relate to observations or pictures taken at the property itself, but um, also seeking the service of a, a architectural historian um, could get some prof professional um, expertise like in, in the historic aspect of it. Um, could also follow Andy's um, suggestion that it might have been a similar, like the same builder. So finding that information out could be helpful. Um, I think the applicants and I already discussed like trying to find as many photographs of, of the property as mm -hmm. possible. Um, I think they've exhausted um, what they could there. Um, like historic photographs, so. Mr. Hamilton? No. Can, I, can I just ask, um, so if it's found to be original are we going to want them to maintain it in that location or would we be okay with them relocating it because it is atypical of the district to have it there and this is obviously a district um well i think the criteria state to especially on character defining elevations to retain original windows in place Just so the applicants aware, that's that's why we're struggling with this issue. Um, it, that, that, it's not to suggest that we're not appreciating the desire um, to do something different with this facade. Um, but you know, I've now served on this commission for I think a little more than four years, and uh, original fenestrations um, on street-facing elevations have been some of our uh, more challenging um, issues uh, during that time. Um, and so I, I, I appreciate um, Vice Chair Goolsby's and Commissioner Johnson's desire to, to try to get this right. And, and with that in mind, um, and we can certainly poll the other commissioners who have not yet um, been heard on this. And I'm cognizant that Commissioner Fieselman has a uh, um, time limitation here for the next five minutes. Um, 
it is not unusual, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but it's it's not unusual um, for us to um, express these exact sorts of reservations to applicants, and um, rather than have an up and down vote with these sort of unanswered questions and concerns still swirling, um, and perhaps no guarantee that you're going to garner a majority of the commission, um, invite you to take our concerns um, seriously and conduct the additional uh, investigation and provide us with the additional information in a couple months time. So as we're considering that as an option, I, I think it's probably time to ask the applicant if this is something that they would be willing uh, to engage in to give the commission a greater degree of comfort about uh, what it's being asked to approve here. I would be willing to do that if we can do this on a staff level. I do not want to wait, if at all possible, two months as my clock is ticking uh, and it's costing me quite a bit of money. So I don't know if there's a way to proceed with us uh, either figuring this out or repurposing this window or leaving it there. Uh, you know, I'm certainly can do that. I don't want to wait two months to think, get my process started here. Yeah, I think I, I echo Chris's comments. We, there's a lot of other work that goes on besides this one window. So if there's a way that we could look at everything else with the exception of this window and, and circle back on this one window with, with Carla, and then we could even resubmit this one window, it doesn't preclude the other 99% of the project. Yeah. Well, I guess sure. let, me, let me ask a question in response to that. Is, is it possible to move forward with the COA, but keeping yeah. that window? And then if you want to come back to us to remove that window, we basically mm -hmm. conduct a new COA. I'm, I'm certainly amenable to that. Yes. that, that that's fine. So that would be a second major COA. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that's what I would support. I would definitely support that. Move forward with everything else. A lot has been proposed. And, uh, you know, and that window is a separate issue. Can I, at the risk of sort of piping in and opening something new, but it's, it's adjacent, literally, is it's, I'm curious about the placement of the front door and the columns and how it doesn't like line up on center in the way that I might expect it would. And I'm curious if the placement of the door is connected to the questions that we're asking. And uh, one question on my mind is as you're gathering evidence from the inside and or from an architectural historian, if you might explore that a little bit too, like did the door and the window move? Are they both original and in those places because of something that was happening in the interior? That's a question that's on my mind. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at like the column in front of this like half moon window seems like you would frame an element that you're creating like I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they weren't doing that during this time period, but like as a designer, I wouldn't put some architectural element like a half moon and then block it with a column. <laughs> it just seems odd um, to me. <laughs> so, let, yeah. so let me ask this question. I mean, no one, I'm not hearing anyone with any strong opinion that this is original. Um, well, you know, can we just relocate the thing? Can we put up? There's a gable vent that's that's not original. It's vinyl. Could it go up there? Um, and is there a possibility to nip this in the bud today, with you know respect of everybody's time? I think I would need to. I need to understand the its current placement and its um, if it's original to its current placement for any role in that is chaired uh vice chair will be how about everybody else um commissioner johnson um I, I, we have to make our decisions based on i think facts and based on the guidelines they're kind of like our our little law book you know if you is uh, um to to speak um but i i need to i think uh I, we i can't we can't base our decisions on opinions only. Uh, we have to have some concrete um, facts and information, something 
to fall. And I, I think we just need to know the status, like Commissioner Bosby said, the status of this window period. Um, we need confirmation on whether it is original or some type of replacement um, uh, window or and, something yeah. added in later. Yeah, and, and the other issue being that our criteria are pretty strict about original uh, doors and windows um, and preserving them, uh, maintaining them. Um, and especially something that's um, street fronting. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure we're in a position to entertain today um, a proposal to relocate something that could be original to some other uh, place on the house and, and, and be faithful to the criteria that we have to uh, honor as part of our work. Um, what I know we can do today is to the extent there is uh, a possibility this is an original window is to approve the COA without impacting that window um, to allow you to move forward with the work and then uh, come back in front of us uh, to discuss the window um, after some additional information is, is gathered. Well, my, my concern is if we were to have the vote right now based on the COA as it currently exists, there, there might not be a, a majority of commissioners who would be willing to support it. Sure. No, I appreciate that. I understand that. But yeah, if I've got the ability to move forward, then I don't have a problem tabling this with some further investigation. I think that's a good solution. So I'm going to reclose the public hearing and suggest to um, my fellow commissioners, as well as to staff, um, that we would add a, a bullet point uh, to the um, possible motion here uh, that just makes it clear that the uh, half circle uh, window um, in the front elevation of the property uh, will remain, um, but the rest of the application would remain as is. Any other discussion amongst the commissioners? I will say, um, it's Commissioner Goolsby, uh, uh, one point that I do appreciate uh, the scale that you guys have worked with this house. Um, this house sits lower than, than its neighbors. Um, it's not built up on the, on the foundation like we can see in the uh, house on the right here. So I appreciate the efforts that you guys have gone to to keep the scale of your addition low uh, like the house. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Any other comments from commissioners? If not, I will ask for a staff recommendation. Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. Staff would recommend approval of the application with the condition of removing the removal of the lunette window from the scope of work. Carla, do you believe that needs to be as part of the conditions or part of just the um, motion itself? Well, I guess it should be removed from the motion itself, but in addition to make it clear that that has been adjusted, also make it a condition which the applicant has to agree to and will need to sign off on. Does the motion itself actually speak in terms of that? Half it might not. Room. It might not call out the lunette window in, yeah. in, in particular. Okay. Right. Um, um, Chair Chair Bashar Gray Smith here. I just wanted to add agree with Carla, but I would not um, add a condition since it, since at this time the window is being removed from the overall scope of the work. I think that it should not be mentioned um, as a condition or even in the motions. It's being removed entirely from the scope, and as Carla had said earlier, they would have to come back with another application to um, basically deal with or address the window situation. Well, my, so we my, don't need the applicant's um, approval like to move <clears> forward <throat> without that being part of the scope. They don't need to I, sign up I think it. if they've removed it during this meeting and we have, they're under oath and we have witnesses, I'll let the attorney weigh in. But I think it, if they're removing it from the um, consideration in the scope, then I'm not sure that it needs to be included at all in anything with this application. But I'll let Krista um, chime in. Thanks. Krista, you there?
think. Well, I'll just say it's been my experience. If someone removes an element out of the application, um, you know, as, as long as we state that, um, I don't, it's, I don't, I don't think we consider it a condition or anything like that. Because we'll need updated drawings and everything, um, reflecting that that is that lunette window is staying. So just to be safe, should we just include it as a condition? Since Kristen's offline. Is there any danger to doing that, um, Ms. Smith? Yes, Krista. Hi, can you repeat the question? Thanks. So Krista, there is a design element here, which is up on the screen. It's this half circle lunette um, window, which is part of the plans uh, would have been uh, removed as part of the scope of this overall project. Uh, the applicant is willing to um, keep the window and really take no action with respect to it pending further investigation and perhaps a, another COA down the line um, for its removal. Um, and so it's a piece of scope that's coming out of the work. Uh, it's as of this moment, not referenced in the possible motion. Uh, and so the, the question is whether or not there needs to be expressed reference to the retention uh, of this window somewhere in the motion um, just to make it clear that when we read the portion of the motion that says that the improvements shall be substantially cons consistent with the plans and testimony presented, it's, it's clear on the record that this, this uh, design element is going to remain. My recommendation would be to include it as a condition um, just for full clarity. Okay. We, uh, we do have this as its own light item, light item number three. So it may simplify the process for you to approve everything but number three. And we'd be happy to draw an elevation to correspond with that. And that's on page uh, yeah, two. After the certificate information. So. Yeah, it's on page two. Yeah. Under scope of work. It's under our scope of work description front elevation, front elevation. Yeah. Line item number three. three. Understood. I think I think what we're looking at is actually on page eight of um, the full application where it's talking about possible motions and the conditions. Um, we're trying to review that that language, which does not, none of that right now speaks to the half, half round window. So simply adding a condition number four here, you could add it as number one and bump all of these down, um, that condition would be to retain the lunette window on the street facing elevation and update drawings accordingly. Okay, let me give it a try. The Durham Historic Preservation Commission finds that in the case COA 2200009812 Lancaster Street modifications. The applicant is proposing additions and modifications to a contributing structure. An existing rear dormer will be replaced with a larger rear dormer, and an existing rear addition will be replaced with a larger ground level addition. Two front entry doors will consist of half light over two panel wood units. Rear doors will consist of fiberglass fully glazed units. New windows will consist of triple grid simulated divided light three over one wood units. Non-operable shutters will be removed from all straight, excuse, excuse me, from all street facing windows. A screen porch with brick foundation, wood decking and a wood lap wall section will attach to the rear of the home. 
Therefore, the conclusion of law is that the proposed addition and alterations are consistent with historical character and qualities of the historic district and are consistent with the historic properties local review criteria, specifically those listed in the staff report. And the Durham Historic Preservation Commission approves the certificate of appropriateness for case COA 8212 Lancaster Street modifications with the following conditions. One, the existing half circle lunette window at the front elevation of the structure shall remain and drawings shall be updated accordingly for staff approval. Two, the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and testimony presented to the commission at this commission hearing and attached to the COA. Three, the improvements may require additional approvals from other city or county departments or state or local agencies. The applicant is responsible for obtaining all required approvals relating to building construction, site work, and work in the right of way. And four, a compliance inspection shall be performed immediately upon completion of the work approved herein. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. All right. Chair Bouchard. Approved. Commissioner Fieselman. Uh, she is. Uh, left she me. left. Yeah. Um, Vice Chair Goolsby. Approved. Commissioner Hamilton. Approved. Commissioner Johnson. Approved. Commissioner Calhoun. Approved. Motion passes five to zero. Great. Thank you, Clerk Holmes, and thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That is the last of our three uh, hearings today. We do have some new business to attend to. Uh, let's start with the minor COA report. We'll give that to you all by Thursday. I know I said that last month. <laughs> I think a little bit after that, but I got you this Thursday. <laughs> okay. Any commissioner concerns about the uh, minor COA report from last month? Second item, new business. Um, Excused absences, I, for the life of me, cannot remember. Do we vote on excused or unexcused absences? I, I know that Tad uh, asked um, weeks ago to be excused due to a um, prior obligation. Um, and I, my recollection is that we don't need to vote on that. We need to vote on whether or not an absence is unexcused. But I might have that completely backwards. You so actually, sorry, go ahead, Carla. No, no, you go ahead. Uh, you refer to you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, you vote on excused absences. Okay. And I am sorry for my mistake. Um, I will go ahead and make a motion to excuse Tad DeBerry's absence from today's commission meeting. Second, Commissioner Woolsby. Clerk Holmes, roll call vote. All right. Chair Bouchard. Yes. Vice Chair Goolsby? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, turn to Carla for update on open positions. Yes, um, so currently we have three open positions. We have two on the county side. One is a general position. Tad is actually being very generous and staying on filling that position for us um, until we get new applicants, which as far as I know, we don't have any yet. Um, so that's his, he's in a general position. And then we also have the attorney position under the county. Um, and then on the city side, we have um, the real estate developer position. And for that one, I know that um, on the 14th, the 30 day advertising period will be up and they'll see whether we've um, received any applications at that point. So um, three open positions, if you wanna um, you know, recommend to anybody that you know um, that you think would be interested, um, then feel free, um, you can refer them to, I think I already sent out the links to the, the city and county clerk websites. Um, in the meantime, we are down um, three people 
two with the grace of um, Tad continuing to serve. Um, and so that means that our numbers um, are really low. Um, we, we definitely need as um, much help as we can get from you all um, in terms of attending and, and next month in particular for May, it's a very full agenda. So I wanted to let you all know in advance um, that we do hope that you can clear your the entire morning. Hopefully it won't go to the afternoon, but it may um, because there are a couple of complicated cases for um, that um, hearing as well. So um, any, any questions? Or concerns? No, I, I'll just add, you know, very briefly that, you know, Tad has obviously served on this commission for a, a long, long time. Um, he's willing to continue to serve uh, while we are trying to um, replace some recently uh, departed members. Um, but I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that he, ha you know, he is looking to step down. And so um, it's, it's, it's wonderful that he's willing to continue to serve, which, you know, gives us seven commission members. Um, but I think we need to try to fill those two other seats as quickly as possible and then move as, as expeditiously as possible to find Tad's replacement. Um, so that means we need an attorney through the county and a developer uh, through the city. Um, and those are the you know, immediate priorities and, and um, somebody general for replacing Tad. Um, he's committed to making sure that uh, there's a smooth transition and that all of us are, are prepared to uh, carry on without him. Uh, he's, he's had great insights uh, the entire time I've been on the uh, commission, but um, let, let's see if we can't um, get the other two positions filled um, hopefully soon and then move forward with trying to find a, a replacement for Tad. We'll have some new blood uh, on our commission. Um, last item of new business, 1106 Ninth Street update. Yeah, so I forwarded an email to you from um, Miss Robin Burnett, who is uh, Faye's daughter, who owns um, the property that that structure is moving to. Do you want to share a little bit about what your um, daughter shared in that email? Uh, uh, yes, it has been a rough ride. Uh, the first thing, one of the things that happened uh, is that when we went down to apply for the hit, uh, we found out that uh, Cliff Cradle had missed a piece of the property um, when he was developing the, uh, the flat for us. And so that, and the piece of property was something that was unsold and went back to the previous owner and so he had to get that and he had to, you know, get a lawyer and go through that and then we found out you know, it, it, uh, we resolved that case. Okay, so the, and a new flat is withdrawn, et cetera. Now, so that held us up for some time, for, you know, a while. But the number one, the, the thing that rocked us off our seats was the fact that we have uh, a mover who's ready to move the building, had brought in the steel beams to put under the building so that we could all see this thing come down the street. And when they started to remove some of the boards at the bottom, take the courses off and take a look at the property, it was, I mean, you're talking about the termites, uh, they are fat and sassy because they had eaten up half of the first floor of that property. And what wasn't eaten up was, was uh, ruined by water, uh, from, you know, moisture and water damage. So the mover said, there's no way that I can lift this property up in one piece, you know, the, the, the uh, first floor and move this property. So it's going to have to be moved in pieces. Okay. And are they going so to then reconstruct the, the first? To get huh? Will they then reconstruct the first floor and put the oh, second yeah. floor then on top? The, yeah. Reconstruct it, right. Minus all the rotten pieces and all the termite infested stuff right. um, that cannot, you know, that cannot come. So, um, you know, everything well, else is coming. That's amazing that you're soldiering on with that's that project. And yeah. You know, Thank you I remember very much. saying, yeah, I was joking at the time, but I remember saying, 
we will move this house and we have to take it board by board over to the other. And it looks like that's what, that's <laughs> what we True to your to word. Do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was joking, but it's, it's true now. You know, so all the historical pieces and parts and whatnot and uh, uh, cabinets that were uh, historic and built in the kitchens, they're gone. You know, everything is the one that's historic except for half of the first floor. And uh, the, the construction was so shoddy. I mean, there was no insulation in the entire house. It's unbelievable. So it was not good construction. Uh, mm -hmm. well, we well, it's typical that, that you know? houses didn't have. It's typical that insulation. you know older houses didn't have um, insulation on the interior, only on the right ceiling level. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the update. Okay, thank you. Disappoint there's not going to be a parade. <laughs> high hopes. No parade. <laughs> but I think there's something magical of like seeing it built up from the ground again, too. So Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's, it's remarkable what you and your daughter are doing. That's, That's terrific. That's what we want to do. We want to build it up from the ground, replace everything that was chewed up, and, uh, you know, then move on. Well, continue good luck with that and, and to your daughter. Okay. Great stuff. All right, everybody. Anyone I have, have a quick announcement real quick? Yeah, go for it. Um, uh, as you know, um, the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions um, is the national organization that provides education and training to um, commission staff as well as commissioners. And um, they are having the biannual um, conference coming up in July, July 13th through I think the 17th. Um, so I just wanted to inform you about that uh, um, conference. It's gonna be in Cincinnati, Ohio this year. Um, and I wanted to encourage people to come out if you can. Um, and of course you don't have to stay the same. I think most people do Friday, Saturday and Sunday and not the other Wednesday and Thursday days, but. So oh, you're in person. Say what? Oh, I was just going to say, is it in person um, or there is there a virtual it's option? It's in person this year and there isn't a virtual option this year. They may try to, uh, um, we're, we're still talking about whether maybe a few of the sessions will be uh, virtual for those who are still not com comfortable traveling, um, but it will be in person this year. And so, and I will do a session on um, affordable housing and preservation and um, and moderating that session with some developers. Uh, I don't remember who, still early, uh, but um, uh, I'll do a presentation and moderate a conversation on that. But I just wanted to let you all know, and if you awesome. want to, you can join me so I'm not alone. What were the states again? <laughs> Say what? What were the states again, April? Um, July 13th to 17th. I can okay. send, send it to Carla to send it to everybody. Yes. Do, do that. I'll forward it to everybody. We actually just had a couple commission members um, participate in a training from NAPC. That was uh, Andy did, and then I guess Krista as well. That's great. Yeah. Um, speaking of in person, I know we did a survey um, last fall, like before Omicron, you know, about folks wanting to get together again uh, to hold these meetings in person. I, that survey was probably. Uh, outdated um, <laughs> before the responses came back in because of Omicron. Is, is that something we need, you know, should be thinking about um, going forward or are we all comfortable just doing things the way uh, we're doing them now? Um, I will say from our, my side, I haven't heard anything further um, okay. from the city on that. Um, so, oh, I was just gonna weigh in on that. Uh, just from a sort of logistics standpoint, I think in terms of what the city approach is at the moment. Um, so city council issued, I think for all intents and purposes, a directive that boards and commissions are to continue, you know, remotely until the governor's emergency order 116 is, is rescinded. I think there's some speculation that that may happen sometime this month, but mm -hmm. unclear. Um, I think after that time, you know, the City Council will have to sort of decide what it wants to do in terms of boards and commissions. 
at this point, I think um, our office's recommendation would be that once that emergency order is lifted, um, quasi-judicial boards should meet in person. So that's kind of just a really informal update on where things stand kind of from a legal perspective. I think after the emergency order is lifted, quasi-judicial boards should meet in person. We don't know when that emergency order will be lifted. It, hypothetically, if it were lifted the end of this week, would that mean our next meeting could be live or would there be some sort of sort of transition period? That is a great question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think um, I think we would just have to sort of evaluate um, the risks of having a a uh, remote meeting um, in terms of kind of legal challenges to to that meeting. Um, so I think we would have to I think we would just have to see. My belief is that we would need to move to a live meeting. I see what you're saying about Order 116. I mean, it's a statutory mandate during periods of uh, declared emergency that we can actually do these hearings remotely. And once that's lifted, that statutory authority is gone. Um, yeah, most certainly for governing boards. Um, I think it's, I think there is some authority for what's called electronic meetings um, for boards and commissions otherwise that are not governing boards. Um, that statute existed prior to COVID-19. It's been on the, on the books since 1979. Um, but I think for quasi-judicial meetings, because of their nature, I think it just makes sense to have those in person. Okay. Well, keep us posted on all that stuff. Might be seeing your happy faces uh, in person for the first time in over two years uh, <laughs> next month. I, yeah. One more quick question. When is the earliest time that we may get a new member? Because um, I know that I won't be here. I may have to ask for an excuse absent. Absence, uh, my organization is having its annual event. It happens to be on the morning of our meeting in June. Um, and so I know I won't be here June 7. Uh, but do we think we would have our new people by June? If the... All right. So, well, I know um, the, I think the city's deadline is the one that I know of um, on the 14th. I was told by the clerk's office that they were going to um, look at any applications received, assuming that we've received one or two or who knows. Um, and so however long it takes from there to get to council for their approval, um, which I would estimate could take up to two months. Yeah, so I think it's kind of. Hmm. I I hate to throw a monkey wrench into this, and I'm glad uh, that April brought that up. I am definitely out that week. Um, I haven't yet okay. reached out to to anybody to seek an excuse absence, but I've got a one week arbitration that goes from the sixth till the tenth. Um, that week uh, makes me wonder whether or not we should be thinking about if it's not too late to do so, pushing the June meeting out until Tuesday, June the fourteenth. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I will. So we already know, um, April, would you both be able to, would anybody be able to attend on the 14th if we moved it a week? Would there be any other conflicts created? It's a very good question. For me, it would work. It will work for me too. Everybody else? Dr. Calhoun? Yeah. Give me a second to look at things here. Yeah, it looks like that works on my end also. Okay. I'll propose that um, with Grace and then. That's great. Make I think all of us should maybe put a hold on our mornings if we can for June 14th, just in case that does in fact be the case. I appreciate everybody's flexibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for thinking in advance on that as well. All right, everybody. Well, great seeing you and um, hope you have a wonderful month. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Okay.